There we go. So welcome everybody to the third in the Exploring Group Project Administration series. This particular one is on recruiting new participants. And I like to think of this as repacking Pandora's box. And I'll explain what that means uh, as I go along because this is about, uh, and let me flip to the first slide. Why do you need to find new testers? So this is about finding new testers for your projects. Presumably this is per subgroup. If you have a large project and you have several subgroups, this is each one of them you're gonna look at maybe slightly differently. I mean, obviously some may be connected, so you may have some crossover, but generally the question about finding new testers is specific to a subgroup that you're analyzing. And the idea is you've done as much as you can with the current set of testers for that subgroup you've done all the analysis you can they've told us they, they they have told you everything that their tests can do you've obviously upgraded them to the highest level you can for them that they're willing to go or that they're able to and you've learned everything you can and so now you're kind of tapped out on what you can get out of the current testers and you're looking at that subgroup and saying gee if i only knew this much more i could really answer some additional questions about their ancestry but i need somebody to test into the project that is of this type and we'll talk about that in a minute and i'm assuming by the way that you don't already have a candidate pool of potential testers you don't have a family that's large enough that you can go to and people know each other so you can go to them and say hey can we get uncle george to test or you have known testers who just haven't joined your project and you have to go chase them down we'll talk about finding them but i'm assuming you don't have a known pool of people either to test or to join the project that obviously is easy enough to go get but when I talk to people about finding new testers. This conversation I'm gonna give you now is gonna, it's probably gonna feel more like a TED talk and that's because I have to expand the discussion out a little bit from the mechanics of finding testers because the mechanics are not that difficult. So, you know, if I, I am gonna talk about them, but the idea of finding people that, uh, you know, through ancestries, through genealogies, through whatever is not that complicated. I'm sure most of you have done this already. Uh, even if you're coming into this new, you have an idea about how to go about it. So the mechanics are not what slows people down so much. What often slows people down about finding new testers is that it's an odd situation for us genealogists to be in. So first of all, it's finding live people, which as genealogists, we're used to researching dead people, but finding live people takes us out of, outside of our comfort zone somewhat. This is an unusual situation for us tracking down people that are still around. It may be in other countries, it may be in other cities, it may be in other regions that we haven't found them yet. We may have to track them down through a number of methods. So this is detective work that we haven't done a lot of as genealogists necessarily, sometimes we have. But it's also this odd positive negative experience that we're going to go after. You're gonna look for people you may never find them, especially if your profile of looking for them is very specific and we'll talk about that. But you may find them and they may not agree to test or they may agree to test and their results don't come back as what you expect. And, or their results may come back what you expect but they don't answer the question you hope for or they answer the question you hope for and they raise more questions than you had. So. It's this idea that you're chasing an experience that may turn out positive, but has a high chance also of turning out negative. And that makes us a little bit uncomfortable, partly because in Western society, we like things to be black or white. We're very yes, no, good, evil, you know, positive, negative experience things. And we like to chase experiences that are going to be positive. We don't do a lot of chasing of things that are going to turn out badly on a high percentage. And this is one of those, unfortunately. We're going to chase down for the hope that we're going to find one person. We may find several, but we're gonna have success at one or two of them. And that, that positive negative thing makes this a, a kind of an uncomfortable experience. And I didn't wanna talk about the mechanics of finding them without acknowledging that. And that's why I, I put this as, as sort of not a Greek tragedy, but a Greek <laughs> story in the experience level, because it's a lot, the ancient Greeks were better at nuances, at understanding that everything positive has a negative aspect and everything negative has a positive aspect. And that plays out in their stories as well. So, um, so all of their gods and mythologies um, had positive and negative aspects. You know, Demeter was the goddess of, of the harvest and of famine. Uh, Hermes was the god of messengers and of thieves. So everything positive had a negative spin to it. 
um, and, and everything negative had a positive spin to it. You know, Zeus and the rest of the gods were all powerful beings with the anger management skills of teenagers, right? So there was this odd duality in everything they did. And this actually, this experience is more like that than it is to things that are more normal for us in our modern world. Um, and that's why I pull out this story of Pandora's box to, to, to tie this to, because this is, um, that's also a kind of a positive negative experience in the original Greek story. Now we tend to think of Pandora, if, if, if you know the story, you know, Zeus gives Pandora a box, actually um, an urn or a vase, but we, but we say it as a box. So he gives her a box. He tells her not to open it. And then, of course, Zeus, in this sort of nuanced thing, he walks away and says, you know, I'm the all-powerful being that, that didn't know she was going to open the box. And I had nothing to do with that. But so she, of course, opens the box. And we tend to say it as she released all the evils onto the world. Well, to the ancient Greeks, this was, again, a lot more nuanced. You release not just the evils, but also the good that comes with each side of that. So she releases disease, but disease comes with medicine and because you can't treat suffering unless there's suffering to treat. So everything that she released has both a positive and negative thing. So the Pandora story to the ancient Greeks was a lot more like the story of Adam and Eve and the, and the apple of good and evil for us. It was both sides of it, right? So... And I tend to look at uh, our ancestors as having descendants in the sense of releasing their DNA onto the world. And a lot like Pandora's box, that they opened this box, their DNA and their descendants spread across the globe. And it's now our job to go find those descendants and put them back in the virtual box, obviously, of our project, organize them, figure out what their DNA looked like, and categorize them and use them to help us in our analysis. So we're, in a sense, we're going out and finding the not negative, you know, but each of these experiences we're going to have and finding them could be either positive or negative. It may have both sides. And that's why I kind of, I kind of tie this to uh, to um, a Greek story in the sense of the nuanced aspect of what we're going to do. Now, that's my lead in. And now let's talk about the mechanics. So the mechanics, of course, how do you repack the box in, in this sense? Well, there's really, you know, th three major steps to this. The first step is you develop a profile of who it is you're looking for. Step two is you identify it where to look for them, or I'll talk about this, or get them to come to you because you can do that too. And then step three is convince them to test, ask them to do it. And I'll talk about that as well. And then of course, once you get them to test, hopefully you can analyze their results and figure out what that means to your project. If you're gonna start with step one, you develop a profile for who you test, for, for who you want to test. So you start by looking at your subgroup and saying, what do you ideally want to know? What information would help you the most? And then which testers, what descendants of what ancestors would answer that for you, would give you that information? That tester, that ideal tester is your profile. And then, of course, you may have several profiles. It, it may be that, hey, I just need the descendants of, of any of these two sons would tell me that information, or I need uh, any descendants of this ancestor or that ancestor, or there's a number of ways that that profile can be built, but you may have different ones. There may be a priority order. I need a descendant of their father would be ideal, but a descendant of their grandfather would do. That's fine. Um, or there may be exclusions. I don't need a descendant of that son because I know that son was an NPE. It was a known adoption, and that DNA won't tell me the thing that I need to know. So that's also can that also could be part of your profile. I need a descendant of these two sons, but not that one, for instance. So you might get some additional information in in your profile that leads you to narrow down the available tester or the ideal testers that you might find. We talk sometimes about rules of identifying what testers, right? There's there's rules of three, rule of four, rule of all this kind of stuff. My my view on that is you, you, you've got to be careful applying any rule to every circumstance. You want to turn that question around and ask yourself, what questions do I need to answer? And what is the person going to give me when they connect to my tree? So if I look at this and I'm using the, the block tree as an example, um, but this applies to STRs as well. You can do the same thing with a mutation history tree. 
and look at where the potential tester is going to connect back. So in this particular example, I'm the new tester and I connect back into the tree here up uh, about the middle of that big block. Generally, a new tester is going to be of most genealogical value within that circle, within the part of the tree that they connect to. So you may not know exactly which ancestor they connect to. Sometimes it's, it's I think they connect about here, but whatever they connect to is gonna give you information. It's gonna help you split up those mutations. It's going to help you understand which branch they they connect to and where they fall on this tree. And there it's it is going to be of most genealogical value about where they connect on the tree. It usually won't contribute much to the discoveries that you want to make before or after that point. So not much outside of that circle normally, but it might be of possible genetic value. It might tell you more about mutations and so on anywhere in the testers that descend from that tree. So it's not going to tell you anything about the SNPs or the STRs that happened before that tester connected. But below that, it might reinforce some SNPs. It might move a few things around. It might tell you that uh, there's a new one that that shows up that hadn't been um, that hadn't been put on the tree yet because it wasn't clear if it was a, a real um, uh, if it was a valid mutation or not, and so on. So those things might end up changing on the tree, may or may not give you genealogical value. Typically it doesn't, but it might clarify your SNPs, for instance. And so if I test a very close tester who ends up, let's say, falling into this part of the tree, there we go, um, that uh, I may, for instance, name those private variants. If it's a brother or a first cousin of mine, I may, I may get a lot of genetic information about how those come together, I won't break up that big blue box block that's above me though, because there because that tester is too close to me to do that, and I won't learn anything about a brick wall. So that's why typically people say if you're investigating a brick wall that happened back in the 1700s, that if you test a first cousin or a brother to someone who's already tested or a father, it won't give you any information for that. It may still be a value. I know plenty of people who are trying to build a genetic profile of their immediate um, of their immediate family and figure out where SNPs occurred, that may be a perfectly good thing to investigate, but it wouldn't help you break through a brick wall in the past and so on and so forth. So when you're picking people to test, make sure that you're aligning them to what the value is you're going to get out of their test. A, a few things to remember, the more you know about your genealogy, sorry about the background noise, the, the, the more you know about your genealogy, the more specific your profile is, is going to be. Um, so if you know nothing about this subgroup, you're going to probably get anybody you can who can test who can fall into this subgroup because they're going to tell you more about the subgroup. If you know a lot about the subgroup, then you may want to get uh, the descendant of that son or that brother or whatever to be able to give you the right information that's going to help you with the branching of your tree. Special situations like borderline mutations or SNPs that might have been called or not called but or a, a, a uh, SNP, let's say, that shows up in YSeq but doesn't show up in FTDNA because it wasn't strong enough for them to call it, those you may want to develop a special profile for. And you may have several profiles, I said that, so you may have, you know, I could get this son or that son or I'm investigating uh, the ancestry of this group and I want to break through that brick wall, but I also want to develop a genetic mutation, you know, um, a branching tree for the immediate family. That's all good things. You can do all of that with separate profiles. And generally, more data is always better about a lot more branches. It doesn't really do you any good to test multiple people for one branch unless you're trying to make sure you really get a lot of good data about that branch. So you might do it because you have, again, some borderline mutations you're trying to set. Uh, but if you don't know, but, but generally, you're going to want to get a lot of testers or as many testers as possible from a lot of different branches in your, in your subgroup so that you can explore all of them. Um, and so that's where the multiple testers idea comes in, that you want to get three, four, five, six, seven, as many as you can that give you more information about this subgroup that allow you to draw more conclusions. So step Two is once you have this profile, so you've developed this idea of who it is that you want to get tested, you're gonna go after three groups of people. You're gonna go after the people who fit your profile. You're going to go after people who are related to or know how to find the people that fit your profile. 
and you're going to go after the populations in which those people may be hiding. And all of the examples down here are, are examples of that. So you're, then you're going to try to find where do these people hang out or where have they left a trail? So you go to haplogroups or other project and find people who may have tested but haven't joined your tree that you didn't know about. You're going to go to other testing companies like Weifel and see if anybody tested outside of family tree DNA. Not a huge, um, um, not a huge likelihood, but it does happen, and people find them. You may go to family reunions and say, "Does anybody know if there's a son of, you know, George Smith that's still, that is still around, or a descendant of this ancestor?" And someone in the family goes, "Oh yeah, I think there was a cousin that migrated to Montana or something," and you you go track them down. You may go to regions, like I said, uh, I went to Scotland and sent out a cold letter to everybody and got one tester to join. So you could do that too. That's where you go after the population in which those people may be hiding idea, right? Um, you may go to, to contact researchers on, on Ancestry or Family Search or WikiTree and say, hey, you've got this person in your tree. I'm looking for someone who descends from them in the right way. Do you know anybody? Can we talk? You may go through your current testers autosomal match lists, and this is where especially you may run into a sister or someone that's connected in the right way once you figure it out through autosomal testing, if they're close enough, and you say, hey, can I, you, you know, do you have any brothers or cousins or uncles or whatever that actually descend from the same line that I could ask to test their, their uh, Y-DNA in, in, in that case? You can go to genealogy societies, you can go to social media, you can go to genealogy conferences, lots of ways to do that. There may be ways that are special to the subgroup that you have that aren't even on here. The idea being that you can seek them out. And if you can't find people who exactly uh, can fit your profile, you might find either people who know them or a population that you can ask to test a bunch of people and see if they'll show up. You can also build out the descendant trees from your ancestors. So you go back, if you're trying to find the descendant of one son, you, you actually do the genealogy of that son down to present day. And you find, uh, I've done this, uh, I have an, an Irish branch of the family that, um, that, uh, that back in the 17, 1800s, we actually have a pretty good idea of where, of, of, their, uh, of their genealogy back to the early 1700s. And one descendant, uh, has a pretty extensive tree of descendants himself, and I need a tester. I need a male tester from that line to test. I found four of them. I've contacted them all, and they've all said no. So, okay, I'm still looking. I'm going to try to find a fifth and a sixth and see if I can get somebody, but that's one way that you can do that as well. The other way, as I said, was help them find you. So you advertise your project on, online or print media so they'll see it, you know, in whatever regions, again, if you know they came from a region, maybe you pick that region to advertise in, or maybe you just do it online in the hopes that they'll find that. You can create a blog or online site to advertise. This is a bit of marketing that you do and just to get people to know that your project exists so that hopefully those people will come to you. Or you go present at genealogy conferences, library events, again, in places where they might live or hang out so that you can present your project and say, I'm looking for people of this type can you help, you know, because anybody know them or maybe someone will see this and know that I'm trying to find these people. Again, not all of these have a huge you know, degree of success, but you're looking for people that you may not even be able to know they exist if they haven't done their genealogy, if they don't have a tree on ancestry, or if someone close to them hasn't done the same thing. So you're looking for people to come out of the woodwork, so to speak, that you can find again <laughs> and put them back in your Pandora's box. Um, Asking them to test is the last step. You've identified these people, you found them, they fit your profile, or at least you hope they do. You, may, you, you actually may not even know, right? Because you find somebody from the, right, um, from the right region, let's say, you ask them to test, and you don't know whether they fit your profile, it's just they have a good chance of it. So you're gonna ask them to test. Now, there's no one right way. There's lots of examples online, a lot of the, of the social media forums and Facebook and so on have examples of letters that people have written or emails and things that people, where, where people have asked them to test. Um, I just have a laundry list of some tips here, but there's no one right way to do it, right? So first of all, you can recognize it's an unusual request. Don't I, I, so I tend not to joke about it. I've seen some people do that, but I tend, but I do, you know, it, it, 
But if I'm knocking on a door, I do say, hey, I'm sure no one's asked you for your DNA before. Let me explain to you why I am and why this is important, right? If possible, if you can, if it's not over email, if you can send a test kit or bring it with you, that has a much higher chance of, now you don't want to push them into it. You don't want to, to try to rush them. But if you're able to explain it and they can decide on the spot, you have a much better chance of getting it right then and there than you do saying, great, I'll send you a test. Please send it back when you get it. That's just just human nature for them. They might think about it later on. Now, if they have, you're going to explain to them the 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 ownership and all the rest of that as well, so they can always go back and remove it if they decide not to later and so on and so forth, right? But you're going to anticipate some unease about three things. So first of all, money, uh, and that one you can at least take off the table if you can offer to pay for it, either out of the group donation funds or some other way that you can help to offset the cost for them. You don't have to pay for the whole thing, but if you can offset the cost, then that'll help. Number two is that some family secrets will be revealed, right? I mean, there's always the case where, well, I think grandma had an affair and I don't really want that to come out. So that might be an objection. And the third one, of course, is the data privacy misuse. I don't know how this is going to be used kind of a, of a response. So develop a, at least an explanation for all of those just in case so that you have a way to, to tackle that when the questions come up. Um, explain that you represent a group, not yourself. You're not out there seeking people's DNA for your own uses. This is actually a genealogy project. It's a bunch of people. I already have 25 people in this subgroup. We're all looking for this answer. We, you would really help us if you could help us here, right? And that's where you talk about the treasure hunt, why their test is important, what it would say about their ancestry, make it personal. Say, look, we're all trying to find this answer. You're the key. If we could get your DNA, you might be able to help answer this question, right? That's that's more of an explanation than, you know, I'd like to steal your DNA away today. Uh, you know, please give it to me. Explain, uh, if you can get this far, explain that the DNA is securely tested and stored, right? You're not testing this in your basement. It's a, it's, it's a company that's doing this. They store it for them for 25 years. Explain the data privacy and the ownership aspects. So, you know, they can always ask to have this removed. Uh, it's stored securely. Um, you know, there's nobody that can see the information. Nobody's going to know who they are except for the admin. Their, their, their privacy will be respected, et cetera, et cetera. Ask them whatever what other questions they may have. Obviously, people will come out with strange questions sometimes. Be prepared for questions based on the reporting in the media. You know, especially genetic genealogy gets a lot more press today than it ever used to. So you can expect questions like, you know, are, are my brothers and sisters going to get arrested for a crime if I give this up kind of thing? And, you know, you have answers for that. And people have odd impressions sometimes just because of what they've seen in the media. It does help to get a family member or a relative of theirs to come along. If you've, for instance, if you've identified them through a sister who did their autosomal testing and you found them through them, ask if the sister can help explain it to you. You don't have to put all the work on her, but if she can come along, someone that they trust asking the question or helping to ask the question goes a long way towards convincing them that you're not just some kook who goes around collecting DNA. Um, Address their concerns, but obviously accept a final answer. At some point, my usual answer is, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Here's my information. You know, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, if you change your mind, please let me know. You know and, and then it's just, uh, thank you for your time. You mark it down as a negative experience and you move on. Um, like I said, that does happen a lot. And to me, this is about understanding that that experience happens both ways. So I go back to this idea, you know, at the end of it, when you've talked to them and they say no, that's not a reason not to go to the next person and ask them the same question. This is all part and parcel of the experience that we're doing. We're looking not, we're looking obviously hoping for the positive experience, but we know it's not going to turn out that way. And so when I talk about this as a positive negative experience, my real message here is embrace that. Don't, don't, Always expect the positive and don't use that as reason not to do it, but hope for the positive. And when I talk about Pandora's box, if you know the full story, you know that Pandora opened the box and all the one, all the all of the first things came out, and she closed the box real fast and trapped hope was left inside. Um, and that's an odd one for us as well in our modern culture because we say, why was hope trapped in a box of evils? But to the ancient Greeks, that would have been 
obvious because hope can be, you know, um, uh, could be false hope and self delusion, or it can be optimistic positive hope. So that also was nuanced, right? And in our case, we want to keep that hope and hope for the positive do our best to explain it, recognize not all people are the same. So the same explanation is not going to work every time. And you're going to get a percentage of people that say no, but you're going to want that percentage of people that says yes. So it's worth it for that reason to be able to get the information back, find the descendants of your subgroup's ancestors. And like I said, repack the box by getting them tested and building your knowledge of their ancestry. So that's my explanation of recruiting new participants um, I hope that was at least helpful, but I'll pause now and let the folks that uh, may have some other, um, some other uh, experiences or some things to add chime in. So thank you for that. Okay, so anybody have another experience on this that they want to contribute? Dave, um, uh, you had one comment come up and it was from Bonnie Bossert. Mm -hmm. uh, and she says that she uses Watto tool from DNA Painter to upload to my JEDCOM and show me the Y and or mitochondrial DNA descendants. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, that's a good way to get uh, information from autosomal or actually mitochondrial. I didn't mention mitochondrial, but that could possibly help depending on your family structure. I mean, obviously, it's a different branch. But if that can help you track down the YDNA people, that's another way to do it, right? So sure. Yeah, David, um, I, I think I had a comment here from someone else that they didn't know how that worked. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware for it. So I'm, I try and tell a lot of people about it. When you upload a JEDCOM to Wado, depending on how far back your tree goes, um, I was looking for a descendant of my fourth great grandfather. And when you upload, you, you say load the JEDCOM, and then it asks you, as it does for any Watto tree, what couple, and when you pick the couple, you can choose to say, I want the Y of the male, or I want the mitochondrial of the female, or I want a typical Watto tree. But it was, it's really quicker than trying to follow a tree in, it, in Ancestry and say, okay, who's the living descendant? Because it'll put everyone out there for you. And then you just have to see, oh, I haven't expanded this particular line. It, it cuts off in 1920. I can build this line out and maybe I'll find a person that um, is living that can test for me on that line. Great idea. Thank you for that, Bonnie. And also Camelia I see says uh, her group is very small. So at this point, just trying to recruit anyone, started a Facebook group for the surname, All DNA and Genealogy, and have started to reach out to Ancestry members with that surname, been able to build the Facebook group well. Yes, now to get to some other test, you're right, um, um, Cornelia, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, actually getting the group together is the first step and then going to convince them to test. Well, hopefully, um, if, if, they, if they've explored their genealogy enough that they or some some of their relatives are on ancestry then they're interested enough in genealogy that they um that they uh, are going to be willing to help you with this right i mean i did i did meet somebody was actually at a party but they were that th there were some relatives and i thought he might be um, be be someone that I would want to get tested, and I talked to him about testing. Uh, so and so he asked me what I was interested in, and I said genealogy, and he said, "Oh, he says I ha I have these rocks at home that I'm really interested in figuring out." I said, "No, no, sorry, that's geology. That's something different." <laughs> and he was not at all interested in genealogy. But anyway, um, so yeah, it can it can vary. But hopefully, if you get a group of people who are interested, then they understand why you're doing it, and hopefully that helps as well. Yeah, that's what my hope was. So hopefully it'll work out. Um, I have found that a lot of the people, if they took the time to update their profile to list certain surnames of interest and you reach out to them and tell them about a group, they tend to, I've had a lot of people very interested that have done a lot of genealogy. So now I'm just trying to back up and talk them into testing. So I'm hoping that'll work out for me. It seems like a good thing. Also, Roots Tech people are the other, the next one that I'm hitting. Congratulations. Hope that works. Yeah. And so Brian Irwin also said he uses the what are the odds tool and that works really well. Good. Thank you for that, for that extra one. I so so I I will share that that uh, in November last year I did I was driving through I was in Kentucky for a family reunion and there was a guy in Kentucky that is the one descendant of a of an ancestor that I need 
to 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 test to figure out um it, the 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 reunion that I was at, he didn't come, but the reunion I was at, but there was a guy there who was a descendant of the same ancestor. Um, and he had the DNA test that I wanted to compare to. So together he and I went and we knocked on the door. We knew the guy's address. We, we, we went and we knocked on the door. He's 86 years old. Uh, and we walked up to him with a test kit, with a, with a family tree DNA test kit. And the combination of my being able to explain it to him and the, the, the person that he never knew was a relative, but that was able to explain his connection, got him to test. We tested him. It came back in December. And sure enough, he's exactly the right one to answer the questions we had. And we got those questions answered. So it does work even when you cold, even when you walk up and just knock on the door. But um, uh, Andrew asked what for where family reunions are advertised. Um, it depends on your surname, of course, and the family that of the subgroup that you're looking for. Um, uh, we've got, for me, we've got a, a surname organization that's pretty active, and a lot of them come to that in order to try to get other family members to join, right? So they're advertising there, and so just going there helps to find them. Uh, but you're right, if you don't know where they are, um, if you know any, I mean, hopefully the current members of the subgroup may know more about where their family reunions are held uh, or that there might be some that are held by other groups of theirs that are a little more distant um and so uh and and so that's that's one way to do it uh ken you've got the floor if you want to share okay just uh quickly uh uh until recently i was a general manager of a small opera company uh, you know a 501c3 and part of that is inevitably is, uh, you know, fundraising and approaching people and asking them, you know, to give you money. Uh, and a lot of people find that difficult. It's not easy. And I think it's analogous to approaching uh, people about uh, testing. Uh, and the way I approach the fundraising thing is I, I'm not asking you for money. I'm giving you an opportunity to help support an arts program to do something good for the community. And that's the same kind of attitude you can take with potential testers. I'm not just asking for your DNA. I'm giving you an opportunity to add to a, a, a body of knowledge that we are all working on and, and do something for others. Uh, so if, if that helps you get past uh, some uneasiness, uh, uh, hopefully, you know, think of, think of it in terms like that. Um, there you go. Good point. Thank you for that. Yeah, the sales job on this one is, again, it's uh, it's not a uh, an easy thing. I generally don't have to sell my ancestors on being able to look at their wills and you know and uh, their 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 birth things and the and the 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 uh, land deeds they have on file because they're not around to ask anymore. But when we're talking living ones, <laughs> it's a, it's a little bit different. <laughs> um. Uh, good point, Donald. So, Steve, you had said there's um, there's a, a list of free DNA tests on the on the ISOGG website um, uh, in the wiki. So that's a good point. That might help. Uh, was the idea there that that would help uh, to defray some of the cost of testing people? That you'd get at at least the ability to do a slightly cheaper test than to get them to do something else. It's a hit and miss thing. I, I've had uh, offers on that list for, uh, I don't know, seven years now, six years. And I've only had one uh, person that I tested based on that that list. Mm -hmm. And that was a person in the UK that uh, volunteered to test and I've tested him. Okay, thanks. Oh, and uh, thank you guys for reminding me. I, I, I wasn't um, um, looking for hands up, so I should do that. I'm going to... Um stop sharing so that I can see the screen better. Uh, anyway, there we go. Um, so Andrew, since since you were in here uh, before, <laughs> if you've got your hand up, go ahead. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, kudos to your analogy back to the Greek experience. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the best part of that is uh, hope for all of us when we're waiting for that correct uh, or that uh, match that really will answer our questions. I was going to say that when I first started out, uh, I have three projects at Family Tree DNA, and they go back to about 2007, 2006. 
And when I started out, it, it, it was like, okay, now who do I approach? Yes, I got first cousins, I got second cousins, aunts and uncles and such. But I, I initially took much more of a shotgun approach. You know, let's throw what we can up against the barn and see what sticks. And I don't have deep colonial uh, roots here. Uh, my mother was born in Canada and her father came from England. My uh, paternal grandparents came from Germany. So right away, I have to go overseas to try to find some good matches. Uh, I don't have these, uh, you know, 15,000 uh, matches has popped up on family tree DNA for me. So um, I did go and was able to uh, find a lot of addresses for my surname projects. And I wrote them. I, I just, like you say, cold turkey, you write out of the blue and you introduce yourself and what you're doing. And I was gratified because even if, with a low percentage, it gets you out there with uh, other people that can answer your, uh, your questions. And, and look at um, whether or not you have uh, common roots uh, going back to the beginning of surname origins and that. I found out that my Hoke Rider branch is almost one by itself. And whereas there's other um, branches and um, traveling around Europe looking for Hoke Riders, um, I was very successful. I, I've got testers from uh, several nations, and uh, uh, I only share with my own uh, family. And so I just want to kind of say that when you're starting out, that uh, before you uh, can really target test, is some of it is scattered gun, and uh, but then you start to reference or target test uh, people uh, uh, more over time. So. Uh, you know, as you say, there's always hope left in that box. And uh, I think we all have that kind of experience. So thank you for uh, your, your great talk. Right. Thanks for that, Andrew. Um, um, Wesley, I think you had your hand up, too. You, you've uh, I turned it off. But did you have a comment? Nope. OK, he might have had to step away. Uh, any other comments uh, on the topic? I was going to turn off the recording for. Okay, so Brian, uh, Brian Irwin has his hand up as well. Oh, thank you. I missed that one. Go ahead, Brian. And actually, Wesley put a comment in, so I'll, I'll, I will get to that one last. Okay, go ahead. No problem. Um, I was just going to say, and I actually brought this up, I think, the last time in some of our Q and A. But um, I've been working on kind of a a project and and it it's kind of a directed shotgun approach because i've i've taken uh you know gone to uh, county london dairy all the electoral you know records civil records uh about 800 of them that are that have irwins uh and and i've uh, where my family is and and uh and 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 started put, placing all of them on a tree and my my goal has been i'm, I'm not i haven't finished this yet i'm still in the process um but uh <laughs> I, I had kind of a soft launch because as I placed all these people on the tree and, and traced everything down to the current day, um, I've already had three people approach me saying, oh, are we related? You know, and they're the they're the perfect uh, candidates because they're they're coming to you. Um, as I as I finish this up, I'm, I'm planning on, you know, actually uh, directing comments and try to come up with a, a as, as slick of a uh, presentation as I can to, to convince them to to test, but I'm looking at trying to find people who are um, specifically in my, you know, my subclade. Uh, we have people who are on both sides of the ocean here, and and I, I'm fortunate enough that I I know who my my relatives are in in Ireland, and uh, so I'm looking to to kind of uh, differentiate some of the lines. I already know that there are at least you know three different um, subclades that exist there, and so try to try to group them, and then. You know, allow that 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 will allow further uh, directed research towards towards your line. So, um, I just thought I'd bring that up. It, it actually, I was I was kind of surprised to see the the people uh, just you know reach out to me. But but that that's that's already started to happen. So, got it. We'll see. All right. Thanks for that, Brian. No, it's it's 
it's nice when you have avenues that you know about to explore. It's harder when you're doing the research to find out unknown answer. I mean, the the unknown descendants, right? <laughs> and there is a a strategy that says you just wait for them to find you or just wait for them to test, right? I mean, that works too. It's just a lot slower. And the idea is that you want to find them faster than that because you want to learn more faster. Um, uh, the comment from Wesley is not sure my mic is working upgrading. I have a horse at the water who isn't drinking. He requested to join the Facebook group and was very active there until the subject of DNA came up. And uh, you have a tester from the other branch. And you'd, so you'd really like him to test. Um, he probably hasn't agreed to yet or he's shy about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, at, at the end of the day, there's so many different reasons not to that it's hard to have an answer for all of them, right? It's just a matter of hoping that they see enough value um, in it. I have some, some, some people that haven't agreed to test that I've come back to later and sent them information about what we've learned so far and kind of like, and here's the hole where we haven't learned what you might tell us, <laughs> trying, trying to get them to agree that that would be a good thing to learn, but you know, they just haven't bid on it yet. So I, 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 I don't have an easy answer there. I don't know, James or Gail or some of the folks who've done this for a while, do you guys have any thoughts on how you get somebody to test that you know is there, but they just won't do it? No, I, I, I see Gail shaking her head. Yep, fair enough. Um, there's just nothing that you can do. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording unless anybody has a comment they'd like to get into it. Uh, Dave, I yep. Dave stump here. Yeah, yeah. So hey, Dave. I, I, hello, Dave. I see uh, uh, two of my Irwin colleagues here, Brian and uh, James. And the one other attraction that might uh, pull people in is my Irwin line here in the United States. We have back to colonial times and we have no idea who the immigrant ancestor is. But with big Y and those tests, we know pretty precisely where they came from and the borders of Scotland. And to me, that was quite a nice insight to get. Uh, I still don't know all of the connections in between, but the Y DNA is so specific that you really can pin things down. And, and James may want to comment. He's really the expert on this who's guided me. But uh, I, I think that is another thing that might attract some people who, who don't, don't know the immigrant ancestor. Fair enough. Okay. Um, hey, hey, James, you're on mute if you're, there you go. Yeah, right. Um, you, thanks, David. You do remind me of one thing, not so much what uh, Dave Vance has been talking about, but when people do test and they find which part of Scotland they've come from, the joy, the satisfaction they've got has been incredible. They're not really interested, a lot of them not really interested in the details, just the satisfaction of knowing that uh, they came from southwest Scotland. Uh, is, is the word is is, is quite quite um, humbling, and perhaps one of the techniques then is to pass that that those lessons on, the joy that a good result can bring. All I right. can agree with that. <clears throat> My ancestor came from Scotland in 1836 to South Carolina, and all that I knew for so long about him was he wrote that he came from Edinburgh, but prior to that he lived near Murthley Castle in Perthshire. And I finally got a big Y match to uh, my uh, cousin on that line. And the big Y match, I was able to track his uh, genealogy very easily to Dundee, Scotland uh, area. So that matches up with the history that I have from my ancestor. I still don't know the common ancestor in Scotland, but I know the region very well. Nice. But the uh, downside or the flip side to that experience is when you have a subgroup that that um, can represent the traditional descent that everyone is traced back to, th you know, through traditional genealogy, and and you get someone tested and it turns out they're not from that subgroup at all; they're from a different subgroup. And you usually often have that subgroup, have that second subgroup, if you've done a lot of testing. But then you have to go to explain to them that the genealogy that they have on file, that maybe their own father or grandfather did for them, and so on and so forth is not quite right or you there's a little bit of a of a wrinkle there or you have to explain to them that they're not from the from the ancestry that they thought they were <laughs> that's always a fun one too anyway uh ken i think you had your hand up yeah just uh briefly a thought on, on when you're approaching somebody and they seem reluctant and you can't 
quite close the deal. Uh, at a certain point, uh, I think it's it's helpful sometimes after you've explained everything and every aspect of it you can and the importance of their testing to it is to say, you know, okay, what's your bottom line objection? What's keeping you from saying yes? And then hopefully if they'll share that with you, then you have something concrete to address. You may not overcome that objection, but at least you know specifically, hopefully, what's stopping them uh, rather than just a, 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 you know, a, a wall of silence from them. <laughs> you know. uh, Max? I have a situation where um, I have a Facebook group that's for the, our, our specific family line. And one of the most prolific posters of that group accepted the request to do a Y test. And we found out she wasn't even related to us by any way, shape or fashion, helped her figure out where she needed to do her research. But she posted, beware of DNA tests in the group. So that can happen. Yeah, that can happen. You're right. I. I will say twice I've reached out to people to test and found that they were already interested in genealogy. They were scared of DNA testing and they were actually very happy to have someone who understood it enough to be able to kind of take on the role of explaining it to them and understanding what it meant and, you know, basically helping them with their own genealogy because that's what admins do in terms of figuring out what it all. And so they were actually, you know, one of them offered to pay for anybody else in their subgroup that I could find. Can you, know, you that... send them over to my <laughs> Yes, I know. So people do have different reactions, but yes, it can happen too when they get disappointed that now they're turned off at DNA testing and now they're actually, you know, actually working against you because they're giving you're bad breath. in my group, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, all right, who else? David, you have your hand up. David, Rose? Yeah, question uh, or for the group. Uh, I'd like, as you said, I like to kind of use, uh, I don't take a no as a no. I try to go back and educate and periodically give updates. And, and I do a lot of publishing on two, we have two very large Facebook groups of the surname where I post all of our project results and graphs and tables and new finds. But, you know, you have to be on Facebook. And so I was trying to figure out how to, you know, is there a better way to get the results and the information out there that I could send a letter because some of these people, you know, I kind of like you, I track them down through and I feel like I could be a detective anymore. <laughs> I get a second career, you know, I track them down. I send them letters, you know, I don't I know their emails. Uh, you know, I may text them if I can find a phone number, et cetera. But if I could direct them to a third party source that has the information and share it with them, because trying to print off something and, you know, it's two bucks or to three bucks to mail a letter to them that gets expensive sending, you know, 20, 30 letters out. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do other people do this? Uh, you know, blog, uh, you know, I've seen some good blogs and I, I hate to create a lot of more work uh, for myself, if that makes sense. It's a good question. Um, I'll let other people answer first if they want to. Um, hey, hey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just address, you know, you spoke briefly just a second ago about uh, people welcoming having somebody help them out with things. And, and I think that's very important, especially with why DNA testing. Uh, a lot of people who test with companies like Ancestry, where they have through lines and a lot of tools that sort of do the work for them. Uh, and they don't, they don't necessarily get that with why DNA testing. Uh, and I gave a presentation last weekend to uh, our Park Society about uh, SNP testing, which is you know pretty unknown to most of our members. And I used an analogy of you know there's a lot of science behind DNA testing, and uh, it, I I analogize that to knowing how an engine works in a car. And I'm not much of a mechanic. I know the basic principles, but I don't know the nuts and bolts of how an engine works. But I know how to drive the car. And uh, I tried to, you know, say that we can give you the skills you need to be able to drive the car of DNA testing. Uh, look at the results, understand them. You don't need to know the science. It's helpful, but you don't need to. And if you need help driving the car, we as admins are there to help with that. 
and right. and hopefully that will get them past some of that reluctance. Yeah, no, that's a good, it's good to give the analogies and stuff. You know, you find people sometimes are afraid of the DNA explanations. You don't want to get into the testing and explain to them how the test works. I mean, that's that's overkill for most people, but you want to give them an analogy of what it is and convince them that it's that it's repeatable and safe and all the rest of that. So yeah, it's a good way to do it. Um, David, to go back to your question, um, I, I don't know that I have a perfect answer. I think when I'm approaching a population, if I'm sending out a test kit, right, like I, I've done at least once, um, that I'll use YSeq for because the test kits are cheaper and I can use that to triage, if you will, and uh, figure out that, you know, who I want to test further. But then that means that if I want them to take something like a big Y, I actually have to go back and ask them for more DNA because they have to submit it to a different company. So there's downsides to that as well, right? You're not going to go to, a, a, you know, you're not going to pick everybody in a particular region and send them all a big white kit to test. I mean, that's not going to be, you know, but you may be able to figure out, you could ask them for their genealogy if they know it or something and do some triage that way or whatever, but you're right. Sometimes you're going to spend some money on getting to them in the first place. And I don't know how you avoid the basic idea that, you know, you're contributing. I know of other admins, by the way, who spend their own money on getting people tested and, you know, God love them. But um, my, my, but but my 401k is not deep enough for that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, well, I, I have to confess, I probably we've got probably probably pushing 100. I probably pay for 80 percent of them. There so, you, you know, so I find if you want to get them tested, you better be willing to write the check. So, yeah, yeah now you have I'm to more, get by the money problem at, at least and then you can yeah. tackle the others. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Fair. So I've tried to find a way, you know, the because I've got a population that that I that it branches off at the first generation that I'm looking at. So I, I need to get in there and I've identified people, but the, you know, I can't get a response. So I want to have, I'm trying to figure out, you know, is it a surname uh, project? I, our surname doesn't have one. Uh, and I've been debating, should I pick it up or not? And I, I just, I don't want to overextend myself. That, that's my biggest issue. Yeah, hey, no, Rawls, I understand that. Th mm -hmm. David th Rawls, there's also some comments in the comment section that might be answers to your question. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that. I'm going to have to download it so I can catch okay. catch everybody's comments. Yeah. There. I'm going to post the comments uh, on, I mean, except for the private ones, if, if there's any, I will post the comments uh, on the channel as well so that people can, can also download them from there. Um, but yeah, there, there's a couple of things here. Adam said uh, he has a colleague on 23andMe, but he didn't opt into the sharing part which is frustrating, especially when they might answer questions for you. I get that. Um, uh, and then Brian said, there's a few people that you've approached who have declined. They just have to keep going. Yeah, it's just a long game. Um, Christine um, uses the surname blog to share info. Yeah, um, there's, uh, it depends on your surname, at the, right? Because there's one name studies. They're more popular in Europe than they are here and in the UK, but uh, in, in the US, there's also a lot of genealogical so societies that deal with surnames and so forth. And you can find people that way through them or whatever. Um, there are blogs out there, you can start one, but then of course people have to find you. So that's kind of the long game too, because getting the advertising you need to, for people to know to come find you is not always easy there. Um, you know. And John has a good point. It, it, it's, it's, he says in, in the chat that, that, that sometimes the answer is to find a cousin who can track them down for you and make the ask, right? So that also works is to enlist people who can help you search as well, right? Has anybody had luck on, uh, you mentioned newspapers, putting ads in the paper? I haven't, but no. I'll... Okay. Uh, genealogy societies, I've had very good yeah. luck, but I haven't, uh, yeah. I've not tried a newspaper ad. Andrew noted that the email newsletters can work well. Yeah, you can send those out to your to your uh, the current testers as well as use them to to go after other testers and say, hey, the, you know, um, here's an example, a uh, short version because you don't want to read all of our stuff, but here's a short version of what we've learned so far, or what we're asking, or why you could help, and so on. That could help. And then Steve noted the one name studies. Yeah, there. I'm not. 
I, I believe in the one name studies. I think they're very good. I have not seen people in the US talk about them much. That's why I say they're, they're certainly not only a UK European thing for sure. Um, but a lot of US folks don't know about them. And I think they need to be more popularized here. But anyway, I agree um, with that. Uh, it's, it's very UK centric. Mm -hmm. But because you can create uh, free websites so at one name, that they will maintain the service for you. Those show up in Google. Ah, so good point. I get a lot of people that find the website and contact me, and the website's a free service that I have as a one name member. Mm -hmm. So even though it, the membership is mostly UK, and I get a lot of enjoyment out of the Zoom calls with them, just listening to their chats and listening to their accents. <laughs> but the services on their the website is useful to me for the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, Jim, to your point, I I just last year had a had had a fellow project admin joke with me because he's been chasing uh, an 85 year old guy for a long time trying to get him to test and he wouldn't test and he just stumbled over the fact that the guy has a son that he didn't that that the admin didn't know about the admin went to the the son and said would you test and he said sure <laughs> so <laughs> he got his answer that way and you're right the children of the people that you're after might be able to test for you and that might be a way to get to get it done too uh james you had your hand up i'm sorry i'm not calling on people but that's okay um yeah one thought that just crossed my mind i've had some people who are reluctant to, to test because they're worried about the privacy aspect not 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 the deep one, but simply being contacted by people they didn't want to get involved in the day to day administration. And the answer I've used on several occasions successfully is to volunteer my own email address rather than theirs. And they then see they're completely out of the, the loop unless I feel that they should be brought in, which in fact has never happened. Um, right. That's one, one way around solving the, one of the privacy issues. Which, by the way, just to note, uh, for those of you who use Family Tree DNA, a lot of us do, uh, they just introduced a change in, in their tools that allows you to put yourself down as the as the sort of manager of a kit rather than the person who contributed their DNA. Like this guy that I talked about that I went to in Kentucky in November and got his DNA, I've offered to be the, the sort of caretaker of his kit because he's not interested in signing on. But I was very clear with him that that I wasn't going to own it, that he had, he was the owner of his DNA. And anytime he wanted to contact me, I would do whatever he asked me to do in terms of taking it down and so on. Well, now Family Tree DNA in their account has a way for you to specify that you are the manager and not the owner of the kit and so on and so forth. So they've started to introduce some tools to help track that better, which is good. Um, so I, I, I just saw that come through this week. So you might check it out as a way to, to, because yeah, I mean, all of us who have done this for a while have several kits that we manage on someone else's behalf. And it's good to, to be able to note those, right? So uh, email address proxy, Jay. No, that's that's true. That's a good point um, that, that you can do that stuff too, to be able to show yourself. I mean, to be able to have them involved, but not manage their own kit because they want you to do that that's what the, if that's how you set it up in the first place um okay uh we don't stop these these sessions um we can go on with anything we want to talk about but i usually stop recording just when the subject is tapped out so if we're okay i'm going to stop recording now